All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Barrett King, who is in Boston, South Boston even. How are you doing, Barrett? I'm doing well. It's not as sunny here as I'm sure uh, you're enjoying there, but it's still a, a nice, fresh day. I'm pretty sure. Good, good, good. And uh, Barrett uh, has over a decade of experience in building partnerships and executing go-to-market strategies with within the dynamic SaaS industry. His track record includes identifying, nurturing new business opportunities, driving substantial growth, and establishing a f effective sales channels. And what we want to talk about today is that whole thing about a go-to-market strategies for uh, SaaS companies, so effective go-to-market strategies. Because I think, I think, I think, Barrett, sometimes like SaaS companies think that there is one model only, and that is to get your product to market, get a bunch of money from somewhere, and then just uh, market the whatever out of it, and life will be good. And you know, just get get yourself out there, and life will be good. So, what say you? I mean, it's sure in part, perhaps that um, mm -hmm. I would offer there's a bit more to it now. And actually, I forgive me, it's a bit of a soapbox. But when I think about the history of go to market, if you look back 15, 20 years, it was the age of original sales, as I describe it. So it was the guy or gal in a suit. Mm -hmm. And so the consumer would go out to that location and they would learn from that individual. They get educated, if you will, and then they would go and buy a product. And then something like 15 or so years ago, 20 years ago, was the age of marketing. So we got away from traditional sales. We moved towards marketing. Go to market evolved where it became about, and it's what we all know to be true today, but digital marketing. It was the idea of educating your buyer before they got to you, before they made their decision, before they landed on your brand. And then today, if you look at the last couple of years and what I expect to be true for the next maybe seven to 10 years, it's really the decade of ecosystem where you see partnerships as a core part of the go to market. And so if I could do a 30,000 foot view to answer your question around how go to market really has literally hundreds of avenues, I think there are these core tenants in terms of you need a really good you know, inbound and content marketing strategy because that's table stakes to educate your buyers. You need educational consultative sales folks because that helps you to engage those buyers once they've you know, certainly in some way educated themselves from your marketing, but mm -hmm. once they've reached out to you initially. And then you need partnerships to expand your reach and really validate in your go to market that you as a brand are the right choice for your buyer because your partners actually own your customer's trust. They own it way before you ever get a chance to engage with them. The opportunity lies in borrowing that trust, adding something to it, and then delivering it back to those partners. So well-rounded approach today, in my opinion, my perspective, really good marketing, educating your buyer, attracting the right individuals, great, solid consultative sales to take that education and round it out to the right solution and then partners to validate and help you increase your reach, increase your brand and really solve for the customer overall. Mm -hmm. and, and I think one of the one of the challenges, and I think this is great opportunity, and I agree with you on on the three tenants that you had there. But even when you talk about educating, educating the customer is I mean, today people are so bombarded. They've got so much information and yes, they can self-educate if they want. But really, a lot of the value you bring is being able to come in there, cut through the noise and actually speak in a language they understand, make it make it applicable to them. Because I see a lot of people, they lead with with content, but it's just like it's a fire hose and you're just saying, OK, everybody else is pointing fire hoses at the same people. you got to do something a little different or you got to go beyond that. Like you said, your salespeople need to, you know, need to be able to educate and understand that the business issues. I think that the interesting thing that's happening right now is the way that the conversation has evolved. So people have got away from the idea that they have all the answers, right? So mm -hmm. this methodology that marketing is just about spraying the audience, about just pushing yeah. all of this content out there, right? And shifting towards a world in which we now think more holistically about the approach in terms of individuals building their brands. So I talked about partnerships, right? And I think partnerships yeah. is the best way to build brand awareness. It's the best way to gain a foothold in an industry where you look to certainly penetrate and emerge and as the, a leader overall. Mm -hmm. But actually backing up a step in terms of my three tenants, if marketing is going to flood the market with, with good educational content, I would argue that you should pull back a little bit on those resources right now and actually invest in your individual sales members and those teams and those leaders to help them build their own brand. Frankly, like even in my own experience, I was a, a sales rep and then I was a sales manager and then I, I led some go-to-market teams over a period of time. And as I've done those different things throughout my career, what I found is the really core 
you know, anchoring concept, if you will, that, that stayed true was that personal brand mattered. And we always mm -hmm. talked about it early on as like, join the conversation and, you know, be on social media and, and comment and post and like, but if you look at the way marketing itself has evolved, it's become this all encompassing methodology that touches every point of the customer journey. Yeah. And so while content on the front end is really important, I don't want to negate that for my marketing mm -hmm. friends, like you are invaluable, you are irreplaceable. I think that the salespeople actually have this really unique opportunity right now to capitalize on the work that the marketing team is doing and elevate that content strategy and those assets and that communication, that brand through their own channels and become their own thought leaders and curate their own sort of audience in that sense. And then augment it again on the back end with partnerships, helping to curate that community and really um, in, in many ways amplify the message that you have to go to market more effectively overall. Yeah, no, and I would agree with you. And that's why I think the the challenge for salespeople is it's a challenge and a, and a fantastic opportunity, to be honest, as well. I think in those those salespeople who make the effort, to, you know, to build a brand who, you know, who work with marketing, getting the right content, who are able to share uh, insightful things at different points of a buyer's journey, or as you said, even earlier on when they're interacting with uh, maybe target prospects on out on LinkedIn or whatever. Um, but building, and I think there's a really important part there for marketing to help build, as you say, build a brand, but also build the confidence in yep. the salespeople to be able to, because in some ways I always find uh, is that, you know, you can throw a salesperson into a networking room sometime and they'll be, yay, fantastic. But you tell them to build an online brand and they're like, mm, they get a little squeaky on that kind of, it's odd. And that's why I think you got to kind of in support and encourage them. Yeah, I think it's support and encourage. Great comment. I think there's actually something about the augmentation. The, um, mm -hmm. I used to describe it, and we've heard this in other companies that I was at, uh, the lazy tweet or the lazy post, right? If yeah, marketing yeah. can curate the language and the brand that is really valuable to who you are and then give that very easily to a salesperson, that's sort of like baseline, if you will. That's yeah. a nice foundation somebody can build. And then what you do is you work with your sales leadership and your marketing leadership in tandem to put on almost these like... Um, Describe it as like a workshop, if you will. So you think about an opportunity for sales team members to come together and learn, how do I engage online? How do I build brand mm -hmm. online? What are the best practices and whatnot? And then in some ways you can actually mandate that. So I want you to go and do a certain amount of posts and likes and comments in such a week. I've seen that in some companies yeah. it works. In others, I think it's about inspiring the sales team to be very intentional in terms of you know communicating with their audience earlier on. And I think I made the comment earlier, but joining the conversation, right? Becoming a part of the audience that your buyers are already looking to for guidance and feedback and insight and being a thought leader. And I've met yeah. some really exceptional sales folks that recognize that the questions they're answering every day, a lot of their prospects and their potential customers have. And the more you can be intentional around sharing your daily learnings and sharing some of the feedback loop that you're already getting from customers and from folks that are in a sales process with you and bringing that to the world using channels like LinkedIn and others, then all of a sudden you curate your audience and you build your reach without a lot of effort, without a lot of energy. And it feels more natural for the way that sales folks are, are today interacting with the buyer. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. And I think the the other important part, and this this is a kind of a pet peeve of mine, but it's like if you're going to if you're going to make the effort and you're going to engage, then make the effort and engage. Yes. Uh, don't do the great post because whenever I see a, a comment, great post, I know immediately the person never read it, uh, yep. and and they're just trying to flatter or whatever. Maybe they're trying, but if I see a comment like where they said, well, something you said here at you know paragraph three or whatever it is, or they or they they query something or they ask a question, then you know, okay, then you're more inclined to engage in, in a conversation or you will remember that person later on. So I would always say, yeah, be intentional, but if you're going to make the effort, make the effort. You know what's fascinating too about that? So it is about being intentional. It's also about doing the thing that theoretically you should be doing already. Like if you yeah. think about the average discovery call, your prospect yeah. should be talking more than you. Like there's always best practices. I can appreciate that. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing your job well, you're recapping what you heard in some yeah. form. You are then offering a, a bit of perspective or some feedback yourself on terms of what you, you know, observed or how they could think about it differently. And then maybe you're commenting on like, have you thought about it this way and presenting your next question to continue that line of discussion. Yeah. If you do that online, if you do that through social media and whatnot, you're actually curating the conversation that you're inevitably going to have with that individual. You're doing it in a different format, which I think is why folks get intimidated naturally. So, but the more you exercise to your point, that muscle and you get away from great posts, like really like what you said and be more specific, you recap, you pose a question, you actually provide real value and that helps you to tangibly build something that has meaning versus that kind of hollowness you're describing as well.
Yeah. Yeah. And you're right. It's just like at the end of a end of a good sales call is that if you if you recap and make sure that you're validating what the person said to you, you're just saying, I just want to check this. I want to validate that or whatever. That, that's a huge mark. That's that's that that uh, is a huge piece of respect that you're giving to them. And people feel that they go, OK, because they're kind of used nowadays to people not really listening to them. Um, so when you actually do a recap or you do a valid uh, a validation on a sales call or as you said even on a on a thread that 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 creates a great feeling of okay that person actually took the time the bills of respect it it allows you in in a way that you wouldn't otherwise get in yeah it's a good comment because i think if you look at you know we zoom back to 30,000 feet we're talking yeah. about the holistic go to market yeah. package here marketing used to be about broad statements and broad content and whatnot. And over time, we all can acknowledge that it's become more of ABM, which is yeah. hyper-specific targeted content to your buyer, certainly persona-based, and in some cases, actually down the individual ad and account. Mm -hmm. When you look at sales, it was almost the opposite. Like we were so specific in the way that we talked to our buyer, yeah. even though that buyer perhaps met a persona you know, profile and perhaps we had a battle card or we had some context for what we should say and we had objection handling and we had that coaching and framework. When you bring that to the internet, it feels like the old days of marketing, which is, should I make broad statements and should I be very open in terms of what I communicate? But I think what I've seen work most effectively, I believe, wrong word, think, I, what I believe has worked most effectively is that hyper-specific personalized language. Even right. myself and my own LinkedIn content, you know, I'm very intentional around not just putting out stuff. And I, I tried that early on. I posted every couple of days and had my thoughts and my opinions. And what I realized was that it wasn't personal. It wasn't real. It wasn't raw. And the more that I was intentional around specific comments, like you're describing, mm -hmm. you know, the, the targeted conversations that I wanted to have and actually gave it thought for a few minutes, I was more effective, which is true across the entire go to market cycle. Marketers being more targeted are more impactful. They have a better ROI. Same thing is true for sales. Same thing is true for partnerships. When you think about extending your partner reach, you don't just say, I want all the partners that fit our ICP and can help our customer. I want the ones that serve a specific customer need or niche or component of that customer life cycle. And now your go-to-market entire package, your, your entire life cycle of a customer becomes hyper-personalized. And ultimately, to your point before, now the noise that we were describing earlier on gets a little quieter. Yeah. All of a sudden, we pay a little more attention. We talked about that salesperson walking into the room to network. Well, what if you walk in that room to do your networking? but you know the host or hostess, yep. you know a few members. Now, all of a sudden you've got this natural way of being introduced that's personal. I think that's what you're seeing in the shift in and go to market, this hyper-personalization, which takes more time, the ROI is actually much higher. Yeah, no, I, I, would, I would agree with that. And you're just on partnerships, because uh, I just wanted to come back to that because I, I, I think that oftentimes, when people are putting go to market strategies together, so you, you got the marketing set, and as you said, then they look at the partnership. And I think the partner channel, and often they overestimate how easy that is going to be, right? Uh, or um, And and they think, okay, and they put in their go-to-market, maybe they put in their forecast, say, and X amount is going to come from partners and all of that. And it doesn't materialize. And they discover that partners are not that easy to to find and attract. So how do you set yourself up in, in your go-to-market? How do you set yourself up for success with a partner channel? It's actually my favorite question to answer. I'm a partnerships guy. It's where I spent mm -hmm. most of my professional career. It is really simple, but it takes intent. So first mm -hmm. and foremost, identify good fit partners. And what that comes from is observation of both your customers today and your customers of tomorrow. And that observation most specifically works when you actually have conversations. Talk to your mm -hmm. customers, figure out who the businesses are that they are also working with. So it could be I mean, this is a HubSpot, a great use case for this. Their, their channel mm -hmm. is, is famous for this reason. Early on, as an individual who observed that some of the most successful customers of HubSpots were working with marketing agencies to do marketing services using their software. Fairly right. logical, you know, hop, skip, and a jump to a conclusion. Mm -hmm. What if we work with these marketing agencies to better service our customers? That manifested into a full-blown channel program where they work with these agencies to package, price, and sell their software as a part of their own solution yep. to help customers grow more effectively. And so if you think about partnerships early on, identifying businesses that are already working with your customer, certainly in, in that example I gave you of using your mm -hmm. software, I mean, that's a no brainer, yep. but integrations, um, additive services, other businesses that are helping your customer. Step one, identification. Step two, engaging with them. And the key is to start small. A lot of companies like you described, 
say partnership sounds good, right? LTV to CAC is better. We're going to get a better ROI. Well, you are, but it takes time. Yeah. So earlier on, start small, grab a small cohort, five, seven, maybe 10 partners that you identify as early adopters, because they're going to help you write the playbook. Mm -hmm. how to work with partnerships in your go-to-market. They're going to stub their toe and, you know, bump their elbows and they're going to figure out how to co-sell with your team. And they're going to figure out how to co-market with your marketers, et cetera. Document everything. Be very intentional around that. And the key thing is transparency and that's through sharing. That brings me to my yeah. third point, which is that partnerships are about people. It's about better together stories at the end of the day. And so the more you can be intentional around establishing, not just in terms of timeline, it takes time to establish relationships, yeah. but also expectations of a two-way street. Partnerships are about better together stories, like I said, which means you should be sharing your content, your best practices, your case studies. You should be enabling those partners, the same resources, almost identical, if yeah. not slightly modified, that you're giving to your sales team, that you're giving to your marketers. And so if you think about it as an extension of your business, then all of a sudden you bring together this idea that looking for customer value and customer gaps, bringing in a small cohort and documenting and sharing best practices, and then scaling through this methodology over time while recognizing it's about people first, you can build a really healthy go-to-market. And then at the end of the day, the thing I would tie up with a bow over this is you know, the coalescence, the bringing together all of your team members to align their vectors. We're going to row in the same direction here. It's about solving to the customer. It's about delivering more value. Yes, they're stickier. You know, yes, they're cheaper sure. in some ways to acquire. They stick around longer, all that good stuff in terms of additional benefit. But ultimately, it's about solving for your customer in the most effective way. And if everyone subscribes to that, your partnership strategy will work. It's not hard, as I mentioned, but it takes time. You have to be patient because these things you know, are not six weeks, six, you know, uh, month yeah. initiatives. They could be five or six years on the long tail, but in the short term, you're going to see ROI regardless because you put the people first, the customer centric overall. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and I think your your point is a very is a very valid one about the the, the people, because as we said, you know, you got to build, you got to build the trust and let's face it, um, most partners initially, I mean, most partners, their attention will go where they earn the money. And if you, sure. you know, if you can't show them that or they don't have or they don't have your customers already in their orbit, you you need to realize that and realize that, OK, you're you're starting off at a, you know, you're starting, you're starting off not with much. But to your sure. point is you can build it slowly and with the right people. But trying to go trying to go too broad when people haven't heard of you or yeah. pe people aren't knocking on their doors looking for services around you is 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 a losing strategy it's an investment at the end of the day like you need to spend the time and money to, to build this thing and you need to i would describe it as like the scientific method from when we were mm -hmm. younger you have to form a hypothesis you have to run experiments you have to document the outcomes of those experiments you have to pivot try new things experiment again and then ultimately over time you know, you will whittle it down. You're going to get to your outcome that you're looking for. It's going to take some time and energy and effort. But if you make the investment, it's proven that you get a better LTV to CAC. You get, you know, 10 to 25 points higher retention. You get mm -hmm. 15 to 25 points higher in terms of ASP. Like all of these proven values are out there. Jay McVeigh actually over at Canalis has a bunch of good research on it. So if the outcome is there, then it's just a matter of being intentional about the inputs. And that's just your team aligning on this is a part of our go-to-market. We should be investing in it. And, and, you know, in almost 2024, if partnerships are not a part of your strategy, in particular in B2B, mm -hmm. they should be. You should be looking in the mirror saying, where's our missed opportunity? Because the leverage and the way you solve for your customer is exponential. Yeah. And, and the trust you build as well, because yeah. I mean, sometimes, I mean, sometimes let's face it, the partner ends up with the, the deeper relationship because maybe they're doing ongoing exactly. work that you, that, you know, maybe you've provided the platform, but they're doing the ongoing work. So naturally, they have a, a deeper relationship. Yeah, they own the trust. Partners yeah. own your customer's trust way before you'll ever gain it and way after you'll ever actually maintain it. And so the more intentional you can be around, I really believe this, gaining their uh, support, right? The, the partner should be working with you mm -hmm. to allow you to borrow that trust from them, add some more value to it, give it back to the partner so they can deliver it back to that customer. That's the true sign of partnership if you can nail that dynamic. Yeah, I love that idea of borrowing trust. Yeah, that, absolutely. So, um, so for good go to market strategy for for SaaS, if you just recap, it's like get your get your marketing on track, especially your content marketing. Make it make it start to try and make it very specific and really targeted, uh, rather than broad brush. Help your salespeople, help them build their brand, help them get involved in conversations, supply them with the right content, and then have a have a robust partnership strategy. 
but start small. Be realistic. Start small and don't like don't put it in your forecast that you're going to bring in like fifty percent of your revenue from partnerships in year one because that's probably not going to happen unless you get really lucky. But is that a fair summary? It is. Yeah, I think about today's go to market is three dimensional chess. If you can establish that the game is not linear, it's not checkers, mm -hmm. right? It's not single, you know, hop straight uh, forward, you know, front to back. It's multi dimensional and it requires strategy, patience, and time. If you invest in that strategy, you include some patience, a little bit of time, you're going to win. Excellent. Well, listen, all of Barrett's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Um, I'm actually right now leading revenue at one of HubSpot's top partners. I spent eight and a half years at HubSpot prior to this, and now I get the unique opportunity to go and help companies to grow better and grow more effectively, which I'm really excited about. My career has been spent across partnerships. I've helped partners, I've trained partners, I've developed partners, and ultimately led go to market strategy around it. Um, I have a podcast myself about it. It's called Outcomes. You can find it in popular channels. It's on YouTube, et cetera. Um, but really for me, go to market is my, my, um, most exciting kind of passion professionally. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm very active. I'm happy to connect with and chat with any of you that want to check it out. Yeah, listen, fantastic. Well, listen, thanks again, Barrett. Thank you for watching and listening. I will see you all again very soon.